when perhaps we finally get it. We get the glory of our Lord Christ. And we understand in His presence those two things that we've never really come to fully grasp here. The immensity of our sin against a perfectly holy God. And the glorious grace shown in his forgiveness to us through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I long for the day when sin is removed from the presence of God's people. Don't you? I long for the day when sin is removed and relationships are not broken because of it. I long for the day when there is no need for pastoral counsel. I long for the day when the Lord Christ himself serves as our preacher. I long for the day when sin is removed and we stop doing senseless things. Because sin is irrational, it doesn't make sense. When sin is removed and we cease dishonoring the name of our Lord Christ, when sin is removed and we, we cease bringing harm to one another, when sin is removed and the entire created order that has been groaning until now, even the created order says, all hail King Jesus, all is well. Sin, sin has a way of hindering mission. Amen? Sin so easily takes us off task. Because it orients our heart to another love. And not just some other love, but another love that we chiefly and supremely value and love more than God. Jesus talks in the Gospel of John how, how people love darkness rather than light. Even some of those who have come into contact with the person of Jesus even some of us who have come into contact with the person of Jesus, who have bowed the knee and the heart and the mind and have surrendered to him and said, I desire to love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then as a double-hearted, double-souled person, we take this darkness this sin. And it becomes our love. And we cherish it. And we protect it. We honor it. We give our time to it. We give our minds to it. We give our money to it. We expend our energy on it. Oh, precious darkness. And all the while, further distancing ourselves from God, His glorious presence, and the joy and delight 
that we can only find in Him. May God forgive us for our own nonsense. Amen. And may we understand sin is real offense against God. And he takes issue with it. to the point where he would send his son to die. This is no light thing. Amen? When we come into contact with the basket that goes forth in Zechariah chapter 5 today, we'll see one more time just how serious it is We'll see the glorious character of our God at work with hope and with challenge. Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. Zechariah 5, verses 5 through 11. The word of the Lord says this. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift up your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, What is it? He said, This is the basket that is going out. And he said, This is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw. And behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. What in the world is going on now? Don't you sometimes think that when you're reading Zechariah? Brothers and sisters, there's something beautiful going on. Something absolutely wonderful for us to consider today. Verses 5 through 8 gives us the explanation of the basket. We see very clearly, it's a basket and it's a big one at that. Right? It's a big one. It holds a woman. But it's significant because it's going out. It's significant because it's being taken forth. And if you're like me, you read that up front or you heard it up front and you say, okay, it's significant. <clears throat> I can tell it's significant. It's significant because it's being taken forth. But where? Right? Where's it going? Why is it going there? What is in it? How is it going to its place of destination? The fact that this basket is going out, the fact that this basket is going forth, is truly good news for God's people. And we need to rejoice in that together. Their wickedness is going to be removed from their presence. Just let that sit for a moment. Imagine the vision. 
What is this? A basket, a basket that's going forth. A lead lid lifted up, that's a heavy lid. A woman comes out, that's wickedness. But wickedness is going forth. It's being taken away. Oh, how I want that for God's people. Now, we've touched on visions that have, uh, that have referred to the removal of sin. If you were to look back at the first five verses of chapter 3 in the vision of Joshua the high priest, the angel in verse 4 said to those who were standing firm in chapter 3, Remove the filthy gar garments from him, and to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So we've seen it touched on already. <clears throat> you saw it touched on last week from Pastor Paul. With the flying scroll. And the covenant breakers are going to be cleaned out of the midst. In each of these, it pointed to the reality in chapter 3 and chapter 5, it pointed to the reality that God would remove the sin that had kept them from accomplishing God's mission that He had explicitly given them. Remember, that's, these visions have been unified in that assessment. Your sin in not keeping my law, your sin in, even when I brought you back from exile, you did not build the temple. Your sin has hindered everything here. But now in chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 5 through 8, we see again that God, by His grace and for His glory, would remove the single most, please listen to this, God would remove the single most influential obstacle of the community's flourishing in God's intended purpose and design. He's going to remove the single most influential obstacle in the life of His community of people. What was the obstacle? Our own sinful hearts. See, they had been saying there are legal issues. That's why we haven't obeyed. They talked about timing. It's just never the right time. They talked about persecution that they would suffer in the culture and cultural context in which they lived. They gave all kinds of reasons. And God says, none of those, none of those The single most influential obstacle that keeps God's people from accomplishing His mission is their own sinfulness. You can be angry with me if you wish. Just please understand, if you're angry with me in making that statement, you're angry with my Heavenly Father who has made that statement. Our own sinful hearts, yes, yes, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. prone to leave the God I love. But the people, the people never took the time to come back and say, here's my heart. 
Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God is saying, regardless of how hard you try, regardless of how hard you think about things, regardless of what your strategic plan is, regardless of whatever you are attempting to do in your own strength, you will fail unless I remove your sin, your sins, your sinfulness. This is their iniquity in all the land. The lead cover was lifted. There was this woman sitting in the basket and apparently she came upwards and he said, this is wickedness. Their iniquity in all the land. This is is the appearance of those who broke covenant with God. This is their iniquity in all the land. The language, reminding us of the language of the vision Pastor Paul took us through last week regarding the scroll, which was the curse that went over the face of the whole land, searching out covenant breakers. That's verse 3 of chapter 5. But take heart, friends. Take heart. The only reason that we saw the wickedness is because the lead cover was lifted. Take heart, friends. Because after the explanation... And the bold proclamation, this is wickedness personified. The angel thrust her back into the basket and then thrust down the heavy lead lid again and contained it. Because God has the authority to do so. Amen? The wickedness is under God's authority and control to do with as He pleases. The wickedness is held under the heavy lead cover. This is what I want us to understand in this part of the vision. God had already dealt with the sin of His people. That's a remarkable thought. Amen? God had already dealt with the sin of His people. He had placed it in the basket, in this vision. He had placed it in the basket, put the heavy lead cover on top of it. Has beings that are taking it to Shinar. Could thrust that cover back on it after exposing it showing that he's dealt with this sin of his people. Oh, the hope this must have provided. Amen? The hope it must have provided. God God has dealt with our sin. Don't, Don't let this be lost on you, fellow believers, embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord. The message of the gospel is a message about God. It's a message about God as sovereign creator who created us as his image for wonderful fellowship with himself, one another, and the entire created order. There was a good intention to his creation. As creator... God rightly has rule and authority over his creatures. 
And he is the only wise and just judge of what is good, right, beautiful, and wise. All was well. The gospel is a message about our sin and our sins and our sinfulness against a holy God. While he had this beautiful intention, especially with his image bearers, in fellowship with himself, each other, and the created order, it was his very image bearers who raised their fists against him and said, we can figure this out on our own. We do not need God. And once we said, we don't need God, we started distorting everything. Because in our broken, sinful minds, we began taking what God created with good intention and we started bending those things toward evil. We took beautiful things and we made them perverse. We took wonderful relationships and we destroyed them. We took the gift of communication and we damned God and each other. We took the good gift of fellowship with God and chose separation instead. We took the good gift of freedom and chose bondage to sin as that which we would favor. I don't need God. The gospel is a message about Jesus the Christ. God knowing the immensity of our sin against himself in ways that we cannot even possibly fathom. He knew that there was only one way that humans could be redeemed, that humans could be restored in a right relationship with himself. And that would require that he himself acted. That he would give of himself his one and only son to live a life of perfect righteousness, sinlessness. It was essential, necessary that the one who would pay the penalty for our sin would be fully righteous. And that if we would be blessed by finding solidarity in Jesus Christ, that his record of righteousness would become our record of righteousness by faith in Jesus. We needed him to do that. And as this perfect sinless sacrifice... Jesus then paid the penalty for our sin a penalty that none of us could pay. None of us could even remotely fathom the cost of our sin. We had no idea of the consequences, the level of the consequences of our sin, but God did. And knowing that, God provided His Son so that we could be freed, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be loved, so that we could come home and be restored and redemptive fellowship with God. Fellow humans. And the entire created order. The gospel is a call to faith and repentance.
repentance. The gospel is a call to repent from our sin, from our sins, from our sinfulness, from our own self-centered idolatry in saying, I don't need a God to recognizing the immensity of our sin and that therein lies the way of death. That is our only hope, eternal death and damnation. Separation from God. And Jesus calls, turn, turn from your sin. A full turn away and bow your knee and surrender to my Lordship, which is good, right, benevolent, gracious, beautiful, wise, Love me, honor me, swear allegiance to only me. Don't bow before faults and competing majesties. Repent from your sin and embrace life eternal in Jesus the Christ. The gospel is a call to repentance. The gospel is a call to faith, a real knowledge of truthful facts, giving true assent that those facts are truly true, and they're truly true for me. But also, resting the entirety of my life and death into the person of Jesus. Faith that Jesus is who he says he is. That Jesus has done what he says he has done. And get this, the gospel is a call to faith that God has already dealt with our sin. I'm fighting a battle. He's already won. I don't always know what he's doing. But praise be to God, I know what he's done in Jesus. Amen? Brothers and sisters, that cannot remain a small thing in our lives. Our life and death is totally dependent upon the reality of that gospel. And we find it in small form here. (laughs) This is the iniquity throughout all the land. This is wickedness. He slams the lid on it. God's already dealt with it. You need to respond in faith and repentance. God will be glorified. We will be saved. Verses 9 through 11. The significance of the removal of the basket. We've already talked a little bit about some of this. Uh, To some who are listening online, who are going to write me an email about the misogynistic tendencies of the text from Zechariah 5, verses 5 through 11. Just give me a moment here, please. It is important to note that while wickedness was symbolized by the figure of a woman, so now deliverance is symbolized as coming from a woman. So there's great value attributed to women in the text. 
but I'd still welcome your emails. Because I, Zachariah, lifted my eyes and I saw, behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. I think Bette Midler stole the biblical text. They had wings like the wings of a stork. Can you see this? It's vivid. Strange, but vivid. They lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. They're carrying it through. These stunning creatures are taking the basket to the, li- to the land of Shinar, or Shinar, if you prefer. And Shinar only shows up, that I know of, in two prophetic books outside of this reference. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 It really shows up in verse 2. But Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, informs us that it was an area in Mesopotamia associated with Babylon. And the captivity of Judah, it's associated with the captivity of Judah after the fall of Jehoiakim. We see it again in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 which tells us the Shinar is one of the nations from which God will call back a remnant of his people. So here, at least, Shinar is a representation of captor nations, those who took God's people into captivity, who opposed God's people. Wickedness is being removed to an appropriate place. I don't want to say more than what the text allows, but it certainly seems just from the text in Daniel and the text in Isaiah and then what we see here that it's being removed to an appropriate place. It's not saying that the wickedness necessarily came from Shinar and then it's going back to where it was because if it was, there'd probably already be a house there for it, but they've got to build one for it, right? Right? Maybe you don't have these thoughts, but this is part of what I'm thinking through. <clears throat> if they're building a house for it, it's new, as is the base for that house. But wickedness is being removed to an appropriate place because idolatry already exists there. The worship of false gods already exists there. Cruelty already exists there. Oppression already exists there. It's an appropriate place for the basket to go. Is everybody in the house with me? They will prepare a house. Where are they taking the basket? Well, to the land of Shinar to build a house for it. When it's prepared, they'll set the basket down there on its base. They will prepare a house for wickedness in Shinar. They will build the house. They will set it on its base. Fixed. Stationary. Done. We do not expect to see wickedness again. That's the imagery that we have from the vision here. Building a house in which it will be contained, house set on its base, it is fixed, stationary, done. Oh, how I wish this vision was the final word like that which we see more fully in chapter 13 of Zechariah, verses 1 through 6. (laughs) That describes the absolute removal of sin from God's people. We're going to find that idolatry is the central issue in chapter 13. But chapter 13 seems to point more directly to the future. And if this vision, if if this seventh vision is only about the future, not about the present, 
it would lack significance for the builders of God's temple at this time. So it's a both and. This particular vision of the basket going forth, this basket going out, as the text says, does not find its full realization in this particular community of God's people. Not the fullness of it. I wish it were true. Many of us will be troubled when we come to Zechariah 7. And we hear Zechariah talking against the community's lack of spiritual sensitivity. Many of us will be troubled when we get to chapter 11, the first seven verses or so, in verses 15 through 17. When Zechariah talks about the community's ultimate demise. So the vision of the basket filled with all the iniquity in the land. The vision of the basket filled with wickedness being removed from the presence of God's people is an already and not yet image. In the contemporary context of this prophetic utterance, in the context of Zechariah's day, the period of this vision, the people could know that God, by His grace and for His glory, had removed the iniquity that had caused the nation to be in exile. And that was no small thing. The iniquity that has caused you, that had caused you to be in exile... The iniquity in all the land placed in the basket, heavy lead cover on it, thrust down in the basket, lead cover on it. The two wondrous beings flying this thing out of your presence. Your sins are forgiven. And all God's people rejoice. This provides tremendous hope and value to the builders in their present task. Think about it. They could and they should continue to do their work knowing that God had shown His favor on them by graciously forgiving them of their sin. We need that, don't we? Their past sins would not hinder their present work. Arlen's not here. There's no hallelujahs in the house to that. Our past sins, by God's grace and for God's glory, will not hinder the present work. Placed in the basket. Lead cover. Wondrous beings come. Remove it from the territory to its proper place. And the proper place of wickedness is not in the presence of God's people. Please take note of that reality. Wickedness is removed from the presence of God's people because it doesn't belong in the presence of God's people people. Their past sins would not hinder their present work in honoring the Lord by being faithfully obedient to His commands. When sin separates us, and distances us from God. Where we are like Adam and Eve trying to hide from God, right? Because we know 99.9% .9 of the time, we know when we are sinning. Will you at least agree with me on that? 
I'm going to talk about sins of, sins of omission, yes. Sins of commission, yes. Could there be times when we do not know that we are sinning? Yes. But I find those to be very few and far between. Because most of the time, I know and rebelliously take that step anyway. Wickedness doesn't belong in the presence of God's people. That's why he had it removed, brothers and sisters. Is everybody in the house with me? So our past sins, and in part, this has to be some of the takeaway that God's people are getting here. Your past sins were very real. They led to your exile, your separation from me, your distancing from me. But I have done what is necessary for your sins to be forgiven. Now you, out of gratitude, just faithfully obey me. I will be glorified, you'll be blessed. And that sounds like a pretty good pairing right there, doesn't it? Just follow me. Now in another sense, the basket anticipates an event that will find its fullest expression in a later event. When rebellion against the old covenant will be no more and a new covenant will reign supreme. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. The basket anticipates anticipates the fullness of this reality. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will not be recrafting laws on stone tablets. I will place my law my very character within them. I will write it on their fleshy hearts. I will finally and fully be their God. And they will finally and fully be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord! Because when I bring this to pass, all shall know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin (sighs) imagine He is finally fully our God. We are finally fully His people. He forgives us. He remembers our sin no more. And He removes the very presence of sin 
from our midst. God will remove their sin once and for all. He will write the law on the hearts of the people. He will remember their sins no more. How wondrous is this? And this, brothers and sisters, is our hope, our confidence only found in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ the one whom we gather to worship, the one whose gospel we have proclaimed this very day, the one who has done everything that is necessary to forgive our sin, to free us from the bondage of sin, and one day, to free us from the very presence of sin itself. Oh, what glorious wonder. God has already dealt with our sin in Jesus. Oh. Praise be to God. This is our story. This we must proclaim until Jesus comes back. He came to seek and save those who were lost. And I stand with wonder next to Zechariah, saying, what is this again? God is doing what? He's accomplished what? And he's going to do what? Hallelujah, what a Savior! Blessed be the name of our great Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you with every fiber of our being, those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, we thank you for salvation in Jesus. We thank you for allowing us and enabling us to exercise faith and repent from our sin so that we could embrace you fully Love you, honor you, delight in you. Forgive us, Father, for our sins against you. We praise you that as we recognize even our sins today for what they are, offense against your holy character, we thank you that those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, as we come to you, we acknowledge sin as sin, we confess our sin as sin, and we recognize and we ask for forgiveness, and we ask for restoration from our sinful activity, that you in your grace and mercy, and for the glory of your reign and purpose, look to us as your children and say, I have already dealt with your sin on the cross. You are forgiven. Blessed be your name. Father, restore in us the sensibility of the immensity of human sin against you. The desperation of those who are in bondage to sin. And the reality of your having dealt with it in and through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we give thanks, in whose name we rejoice, in whose name we speak of our great hope of redemption, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. What a Savior.